Fascinating as fuck. The toy company Mattel released a vibrating Nimbus 2000 broomstick that was so stimulating that it was quickly discontinued. However, sex shops started buying them up like candy and selling the toy for double the price. While the Gambia is one of the poorest countries on earth, it has become a hotspot for tourism. More specifically, female sex tourism. Rich European women seeking out young African men is the country's main attraction. A study in 2012 found that the majority of men and women in long-term platonic relationships shared some level of both physical and sexual attraction. So yeah, there's a chance she's into you, bro. A man in China, Yang Hu, cut off his PP because he was tired of being single. However, he immediately regretted his decision and rushed to the hospital to get it reattached, but he left it at home. If you hear a knock at the door and open it to see this, slam the door shut and hide immediately. Now, it was close to midnight when the doorbell rang. I peered out the window, but I couldn't see anyone. And when I opened the front door, two kids were standing there, a boy and a girl about 10 years old. Can we come inside and use your phone? The boy asked. We're locked out. And I started to say okay. When both kids looked up at me, their eyes were pitch black. No iris, just giant pupils. Dark voids that seemed to suck me in. And a knot formed in my stomach. Please. The girl begged as they stepped towards the door. Adrenaline flooded my veins and I slammed the door and locked it and then scratching sounds came from outside as I ran to hide. Because I know that people who let the black eyed kids inside are never seen again. At 8.30 this morning, a 15 year old girl was murdered on her way to school in Croydon, South London. Officers were on the scene within two minutes of receiving a 999 call to say that a schoolgirl had been stabbed. A bus driver and a passerby tried to resuscitate the girl, but their efforts were futile and tragically she died at the scene. A cordon could be seen surrounding a double-decker bus and a white tent was also erected outside the Whitgift Centre. A bunch of flowers had also been placed at the scene. Shockingly, this is the 15th teenage homicide just this year, with three months still to go. Last year, there were 14. In the last 12 months, Croydon has had more stabbings than any other London borough, with 211 knife crime offences recorded. A 17-year-old boy has been arrested on suspicion of murder, and it's thought that he was known to the victim. I'll update, obviously, in the comments when there is any more information on this case. So some people blame Britney Murphy's death on her house being haunted, and some people blame her house being haunted on Britney Spears. Let's take a deeper look. This is the house that Britney Spears lived in in the early 2000s with Justin Timberlake. Apparently one night after a weekend of partying, she had a Reiki healer come and do a private session. But after he left, Britney Spears thought that he had opened a portal inside of her home while he was there. And now evil spirits were coming out of the portal and trying to push her down the stairs. Terrified, she moved out of the house. And who should move in next but Britney Murphy, who was reportedly also terrified of the home. In December of 2009, Brittany Murphy passed away inside of the home under very mysterious circumstances. She developed extremely bad pneumonia out of nowhere. And people were quick to blame her husband for potentially poisoning her, except that he passed away five months later from the exact same thing. Theories surrounding the death range from toxic mold to hentavirus to spirits that came from the portal that Britney Spears' Reiki healer opened. But we're talking about all sorts of haunted homes on here, so make sure you follow along will never want to be alone again after hearing what happened to Tara because it could happen to anyone. Tara was sitting on her couch watching The Walking Dead when she noticed that her motion detector lights came on. Thinking it was probably just an animal, she goes back to watching the show. Well, a couple of minutes later, she notices a silhouette of a person standing outside the living room window. And then all of a sudden, the person starts banging on the window. Tara grabbed her phone and ran into the bathroom while calling 911. And that's when she hears the glass shatter. A few seconds later, she reaches up to unlock the door to see if anybody's out there. And as she's opening it slowly, right there in the hallway was a deranged looking woman. And she starts to sprint towards Tara after seeing her and banging herself into the door. Luckily, that's when the cops showed up and told Tara that the woman was an escapee from a local insane asylum and she had already killed two people. Child allegedly shot his mum over a VR headset. 
An 11-year-old boy is due to stand trial for allegedly shooting his mum in the face for not allowing him to buy a VR headset. The boy was 10 years old at the time of the shooting on the 21st of November 2022 in Milwaukee. He remains unidentified to protect his identity, obviously due to his age. It's believed that the boy's mum refused to buy him a virtual reality headset off Amazon and he shot her in anger. It's alleged that he got the weapon that morning out of his mum's locked safe. She was shot in the eye and died. It's alleged that the boy then attempted to hide the gun and then told his big sister what had happened. She then obviously phoned police. Shockingly, the child is then believed to have logged into his mum's Amazon account the day after her death to buy the headset. It's believed that the boy had rage issues and he allegedly previously set the family home on fire. His grandmother claimed that the boy always reported hearing voices. Interestingly, cameras around the house had been unplugged prior to the incident. The now 11-year-old boy faces charges of first-degree reckless homicide. I am. Oh, you're so traumatized. It makes me want to cry. You dumb bitch. The case that I was going over in this video was the tragic case of Hella Crafts. Hella Crafts was a woman that was born on July 7th, 1949. She lived a great life and from a young age she had an interest in planes. And this would all translate into her adulthood when she would become a Danish flight attendant. Everything was going amazing when she would eventually meet Richard Crafts. And Richard himself was the Eastern Airline commercial pilot. The two would end up getting married and they would have three beautiful kids together. Everything went well for a while until turmoil started to strike the family. After a lot of arguments and everything would go on, Hella would decide to file for divorce. But Richard didn't like this too much. Things would get especially worse when one day, Hella would go missing. Nobody knew what was going on, but of course, right out of the gate, Richard was the prime suspect. So the police decided to get involved. They investigated for a very long time, but they were never able to find her body. But what they were able to find will shock you. While police were out doing their investigations throughout the snow, they discovered some haunting things. They were able to find 2,660 hairs, one fingernail, one toenail, two teeth, one tooth cap, and five droplets of blood. And of course, this is more than enough DNA to be able to figure out who it belonged to, and they found out it belonged long to hella crafts richard had killed his wife and disposed of her body in a wood chipper and today it's one of the only cases in which a body has never been found in connecticut it's a very dark disturbing case but it makes a lot of sense as to why i made this video why would you lie and then i realized you're just as naive as a woman was killed at SeaWorld while performing with a killer whale dawn brancho worked at SeaWorld in florida for years People regularly flocked to the park to watch the orcas perform alongside their trainers. Dawn had been inspired to get into this line of work after visiting SeaWorld at just 10 years old. She fell in love with the animals and the idea of getting close to and working with them. However, on February the 24th, 2010, SeaWorld changed forever. If you've seen the documentary Blackfish, you will understand just how awfully these wild animals are treated at these inhumane parks. Dawn's death would highlight this to the world. Dawn was frequently paired with orcas and would perform stunts to the astonished crowd. She developed a close bond with the now infamous orca called Tillicum. On the day in question, the pair were performing their live killer whale show. Stunned witnesses gasped as they watched Tillicum grab Dawn by her ponytail. He pulled her underwater and began swinging her viciously. Quickly, she began to drown. Tillicum thrashed around so violently that, and please turn off now if you are squeamish, Dawn's jaw broke, her arm was dislocated, and her vertebrae and ribs were snapped. Her scalp was also completely removed from her head. No Seawell trainer ever again entered the pool with orcas. Now, Tillicum was known to be involved in the death of trainer Kelty Byrne in 1991. I did a video about that, so you'll find it in this playlist. He was also involved in the death of Daniel Jukes in 1999. Let me know if you'd like to see a video on that. Tillicum passed away in 2017. Someone recently asked me what the strangest thing I've seen in a police file is, and I think I have an answer. It's this trash can. Let me explain. So this trash can was found in Joan Rish's house in 1961, immediately after she went missing. Her young daughter had gone to a neighbor's house and told the neighbor that mommy is missing and there's red paint all over the kitchen. And when the police got there, they saw that the red all over the kitchen was blood. But there were also a few really weird details like this trash can, so the police had no idea what had happened to Joan. So first and foremost is the fact that this trash can is just in the middle of the kitchen. Normally it was under the sink, but here it is just in the middle of the kitchen for no reason. And then the contents of the trash made no sense. So here is the phone receiver, which has been ripped from the wall. 
You can see in this photo here that the phone is still on the wall, but just the mouthpiece was ripped off and then moved across the kitchen and neatly placed on the trash. And on the phone was a fingerprint they could never identify. People hypothesized that maybe someone was there and when Joan went to call for help, they ripped the mouthpiece off. Then there was this beer. So Joan's husband was out of town when this happened, but when he came back, he said that no one in the house drank Miller High Lifes. He didn't drink it, Joan didn't drink it, the trash had been taken out since the last time people were over, but yet there's Miller High Life next to the trash. Joan disappeared that day and was never seen again. And these two little pieces right here are some of the only evidence that someone else may have been in the house. They don't know if she ran away on her own, if she was taken or what. But the whole story is really wild and I tell it all tonight on the episode. Also, merch goes live when the episode drops. Led downstairs one by one to their playroom and bludgeoned by their father. These three children were the victims of a quadruple murder. They were killed alongside their mother in July 2006. Rahan Arshad then fled the country on a pre-booked ticket to Bangkok, leaving all his family in that house to decompose. The victims weren't found until a month later and had to be identified by their dental records due to how vicious the attack had been. Rahan's wife, Uzma, had been killed in the bedroom before he then turned on the children. He then led his three young children down the stairs into their playroom one by one and bludgeoned them to death with a rounder's bat. Adam was 11, Abbas was 8 and Henna was just 6. Police spotted Rahan's BMW travelling to Heathrow Airport on the 27th of July when they checked CCTV. He parked up in a short-stay car park and fled the country. Just that week, he'd taken his children shopping to buy buckets and spades, telling them that he was taking them on holiday. In actual fact, he'd only booked one ticket, for himself. Rahan was arrested in Thailand on August 30th, a month after the murders, and he came back to the UK and was questioned by police. He told them that when he got home that fateful day, he found his children dead and that his wife had killed them, so he had to kill her. He said that he'd found out Uzma was having an affair back in 2004 and that he'd left the family home. But a year later, he moved back in and the couple reconciled, although Uzma had told her brother, count the days until he kills me. Just a year later, her prediction came true. Rahan went on trial and it took the jury only two hours to come back with a unanimous guilty verdict. And he was sentenced on May 30th, 2007 to life in prison. A sommelier based in California was sentenced to 14 years behind bars for flying to Texas to torture a human trafficking victim and try to force her into sex work. In November 2022, Ian Justin Ranny, who's 35 years old, responded to an online ad posted by a supposed human trafficker who worked with high-end clientele. They were looking for an experienced sadist who would be paid six grand to take a woman to an abandoned warehouse and quote, break her. Now this seemingly horrible person was actually a federal agent, not a human trafficker, and this was a sting operation. Ian obviously didn't know this, so he accepted the gig, and what he planned to do to this woman is just horrific. He wanted to tie her up and waterboard her for days and torture her by covering her body in chemicals. He even wanted her to wear blackout, sensory deprivation, eye contacts, and he wanted to film it. It's reported that he was going to try to leave her undamaged, with the worst case scenario being a broken bone or two. He told agents he specialized in degradation and objectification and had, quote, psychologically destroyed a few girls. When he was arrested outside of a warehouse in North Texas, he had tools on him, restraints, ropes, batons, and this was not an isolated incident. Prior to his arrest, Randy was actually living with a husband and wife in a throuple where he would sleep with and torture the woman. A source told DailyMail.com that he tormented this woman to the point that she was so traumatized, she couldn't even openly discuss this relationship. In February of this year, Randy pled guilty to attempted kidnapping as well as possession of child pornography because on top of all of that, he was found with images of minors. The EDP 445 story is disturbing. And if you don't know the details of this, you really should keep watching. So EDP was known for ranting, making funny videos on YouTube. At the time that he was caught, he had millions and millions of subscribers. And he was an avid fan of the Philadelphia Eagles. And he had a lot of fans. He really was a celebrity on YouTube. He would do cooking videos. He would react to things. People always used his voice and his image in different memes and reaction videos. But in July 2020, the world would begin to view him in a very different light. 
So in July of 2020, some disturbing messages began to surface that EDP had sent fans. In one chat, he requested to be a 16-year-old's boyfriend and asked for some help in some activities. He was also seen requesting pictures from children, if you know what I mean, what kind of pictures I'm talking about, in payment for merch and other goods. And yeah, at that point, there was a lot of video evidence that he was attracted to minors and was actively trying to seek one out to abuse. But nobody really believed that he would be that dumb to go out and do it. Obviously, I think he should have been canceled already based on what he had been saying, but that leads us to 2021. So in April of 2021, EDP was caught in an online predator sting put on by the group Predator Poachers. Apparently in the chats that these predator hunters had had with EDP-445, he had exposed his uh, private areas. He had talked very graphically about what he wanted to do with this supposed 13-year-old child. And yeah, this entire time EDP thought he was talking to a 13-year-old girl, but he was talking to this guy. Obviously, this was extremely problematic, and in a lot of these cases, the people who exchange these messages with people pretending to be minors actually end up being arrested and sent to jail or prison. And while you think this may have been enough evidence to charge EDP with a crime, it actually wasn't, and the police department opened an investigation but said, due to some flaws in the actual sting operation itself, they couldn't charge him. So nowadays I've heard a lot about EDP and where he's been at. He apparently can't keep a job, he can't get housing, and hopefully some sort of charge will be brought up one day, but I'm just not too sure that it ever will. This YouTube pedophile known as Lion Maker Studios had almost a million subscribers before he was finally banned from the platform. So Lion Maker was a very, very famous YouTuber who played Minecraft. Now, I've never really ventured into the gaming side of YouTube, but I know a lot of people have, and a lot of people knew who Lion Maker was and loved his content before all of these things came out about him. So obviously, when you have a Minecraft channel, your target audience is going to be a bit younger. And obviously, when you have a younger fan base, your responsibility to create good, wholesome content is a lot higher. But what Lion Maker did was absolutely abhorrent. So in reality, Lion Maker Studios' real name is Marcus Wilton. And in 2015, when Marcus was 27 years old, he admitted to having a smexual relationship with a 15-year-old girl. The victim, a young 15-year-old girl, was also a YouTuber herself. And after all of this came out, Marcus actually went to Twitter and posted CP images, which he later blamed on some sort of a glitch. After this started to come out, two other minors accused Marcus of trying to groom them. And he was then investigated by authorities in Belgium and the United Kingdom for charges of CP production and distribution. So after this came out, he was actually held in jail by Belgian police for 10 months. But that didn't stop the controversies from appearing. So at the same time that all this was coming out, 2015 to 2016, six different minors came forward and said that Marcus had asked them for uh, inappropriate photographs of themselves. One 16-year-old named Steven even stated that Marcus offered to pay him $500 for these explicit photographs of himself. However, when this came out, Marcus said that that $500 was intended for graphic design and denied that this had happened. In another instance, Marcus was accused of asking a 12-year-old girl for these explicit photographs as well. Obviously, he denied this, but there were actual screenshots of the messages of him asking this girl for photographs. But as predators do, he claimed that these were fake messages that had been manipulated to make him look bad. So eventually he was permanently banned from YouTube. He tried to make a comeback, was banned again. He resurfaced as a streamer before he was banned again. But I couldn't really tell whatever came out of the legal troubles that he faced in Belgium. I know that he was held in jail, charged with these CP-related crimes, but I couldn't really find if he was ever convicted of them. Obviously though, this guy is a danger to have online and People should be aware that this guy is probably still out there somewhere making new accounts. Teenager's reaction to getting a life sentence. That there is only one appropriate sentence in this case. Mr. Fishy, if you and your attorneys would please rise. So counsel, is there any legal reason why this court cannot impose sentence at this time? Nothing. Mr. Fuji, having entered a plea of guilty to the crime of first-degree murder, I adjudicate you guilty of the premeditated first-degree murder of Tristan Bailey. I sentence you to life in prison. Because of your age, you are eligible for a review of the sentence in 25 years. This is by far one of the weirdest quotes that I've ever researched before.
So in the 1920s in LA, May Otis Blackburn and her daughter Ruth started this cult called the Great Eleven Club, and it was entirely run by women. They said that they were contacted by two angels and were told they needed to write a book revealing all the secrets about the universe. They also believed that once the apocalypse happened, 11 queens would rule the world from Hollywood mansions. Honestly, sounds like a good time to me. So this is May's stepbrother and husband, Ward. Um, he really contributes nothing to the story except that he was a pedophile and has five inch fingernails. For the most part, it was just a money laundering scheme, but they did call this thing the light of God. And like now that we're worshiping cats, I'm down. Eventually though, shit did get really weird because they started sacrificing animals and then kept a dead girl in a bathtub for three years. Check out episode 61 for more info. My husband murdered me and our unborn son. My name is Sean N. Watts. I was 34 years old when my husband Chris Watts murdered me in August 2018. We had been married for nearly eight years and had two young daughters, Bella and Celeste. I was also 15 weeks pregnant with our son, Nico. Chris and I met in 2010 and married in 2012. We built a beautiful life together in Colorado. Everything seemed perfect until June 2018 when Chris started acting distant. I tried to save our marriage, but on August 13, 2018, Chris murdered me and our daughters. He dumped our bodies at his work site before burying our unborn son in a shallow grave nearby. That morning started normally. Chris woke me up for work, I dropped the girls off at school and went to a doctor's appointment where we heard Nico's heartbeat. When I came home, Chris smothered and strangled me in our bed. He then took the girls to an oil field and strangled, suffocated and dumped their bodies in oil tanks. He claimed we had vanished. Two days later, Chris confessed and led police to our remains. At his sentencing, Chris gave a rambling speech, but never explained why he did it. My parents and brother were devastated, left only with memories of the happy times we shared as a family. Chris robbed us of the opportunity to grow old together, to watch our children thrive and have families of their own. My story serves as a sobering reminder that you never really know what goes on behind closed doors or what darkness may lurk inside someone. I just hope our tragedy can help prevent others from suffering the same fate. Thank you for listening to my story. If you want to support us and learn about the stories of other people, consider following us. Oh my god, I'm sorry. I found, um, I found this bone. And it looks like a hip bone of a human and it looks like it's been cut off me can leave um and that looks like the bit that you put a leg into and i'm about to have a heart attack this is where i am i'm in the middle of the woods i'm on this bit that
more of like proof I have that I'm comfortable sharing. Um, so as you can see, this date was December 13th of 2015, and that is a screenshot of me talking to one of my friends and telling her a little bit about what happened. Here is just some of the evidence that immediately following and even before I was blackmailed, um, these people had obviously explicit photos of me and um, shared them on websites and told me that I had to continue um, to send them pictures uh, and I wasn't allowed to report anything about what happened or something would happen. It was pretty extensive blackmail, but yeah. They were each kind of like trying to blame it on each other. So uh, one of the guys involved Snapchatted me and basically like tried to act really concerned. Um, and I was like, are you okay? Whatever. Um, and yeah, you can see here, I said like, no, you nearly killed me three weeks ago. This was a group chat that um, I was talking to some of my other friends that weren't involved. And again, you can see the date, January 3rd, 2016. Um, and he asked me, I guess I don't have a screenshot, um, why wouldn't you be mad at blank? Because she did nothing to help. Um, she didn't call an ambulance or, um, yeah, and she lied. Honestly, a lot of people involved were trying to create confusion in the situation. I suffered pretty significant drug-induced psychosis. I was hospitalized for a while. Um, this is a message to another one of my friends where I basically told them that I didn't feel well. I hated this person for doing that to me. And actually, just so you have the date on that, December 21st, 2015, I literally just got out of the hospital. I'm trying to block out more names of some of my friends um, that I don't really talk to anymore right now. But as you can see, like I told them that I was confused, I was really messed up. Uh, those people, that's not their actual name, so it's fine. Um, but yeah, again, a lot of confusion. Now, the, that is just the evidence that I am comfortable sharing with the internet. Obviously, I have mounds and mounds more. Um, there are police reports, numerous police reports actually, and um, physical evidence and hospital evidence, etc. While no one was ever tried criminally in this case, there are a lot of reasons for that, um, which I will probably get more into in my book, but if you have some like very basic questions on it, I might answer. Um, honestly, it's still pretty traumatic to talk about. But these people um, were charged criminally for other cases, um, including assault on a minor. Um, and yeah, but I am protecting identities still, um, just because it's a lot to process and um, a lot of these people were kids. <laughs> All right, y'all, you have convinced me we are doing a spark note story time. Buckle the fuck up. I've waited seven years to tell this story and I sure as shit have receipts. This is not all of the evidence I have. Um, I just pulled out the evidence that I think is appropriate for this video. So the month is December, the year is 2015. I turned 16 at the end of November. Um, and I had at this point been physically, mentally, and sexually abused for several years. And my best friend um, was aware of it and had close personal ties with the perpetrator. I had recently got out of that situation or so I thought. Um, and so we were gonna hang out and uh, go and hang out with a couple of our other friends and we were going to uh, smoke a little bit. The night before it all happened, she texted me and told me that I needed to look super hot and dress a certain way and whatever, um, and that we needed to lie to my parents about where we were going, which I was scared to do because it wasn't something that I had ever done before. She didn't let me leave the house until I looked completely different, and when we got to the place um, that we had lied to my parents and had um, her parents drop us off at, we walked over to our mutual friend's house um, to go and, you know, do our thing. Now, it is extremely normal for teenagers to experiment with things like smoking, drinking, etc. Um, and honestly, that's all that this was to me. So we got to this guy's house and sat down. On the way there, she kept asking me like, so you're gonna smoke, you're gonna do this, whatever. And I was like, yeah, because at that point I had already tried it many times before and honestly had years of experience under my belt. When we sat down on this guy's furniture, um, she just announced that she wasn't going to be partaking. And um, so he was like, okay. 
and lit up a water bottle bong, handed it to me and said, ladies first. I was like, all right. And I inhaled one, one hit. And I started coughing and he was like, oh my God, I didn't expect you to be breathing it in that long. And I said, why? We've literally done this together for every weekend for the last few months. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? Um, and he says to me, nothing, that's just some fire shit. I don't think you're prepared. That struck me as odd, um, and I started to get dizzy within like maybe two, three minutes, so I laid down. The next thing I remember is being assaulted, choked, beaten, um, begging for them to stop, begging for them to call 911 until um, his mom came upstairs. And she said, this girl needs to get the fuck off of my property. She's going to die here. You need to get her out. I didn't wait around. I quickly ran and um, they followed me down the stairs and my best friend said, Lexi, do you even know where you are? And that was the first time I realized that I wasn't dreaming. I'll make a part two.